Hey, and we're live. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. It is uh, April 11th, and this is Deribit Live. I'm your host, Shane Oglo, with my partner, Richard Hodges, as always, and we're the Rogue Traders. And uh, I will say to you, Richard, happy Barbershop Quartet Day. I bet you didn't know it was Barbershop Quartet Day. I, I did not, no. It is, yeah. Yeah. So uh, for all the nerds out there who uh, like to do that kind of stuff, uh, kudos. So we got uh, you know we got a lot to talk about today. Um, we have uh, we've had a great market for trading. I'm actually kind of excited to show uh, people a little bit about uh, some of the discretionary trades we've been doing and, and some of the trades too on the on the Road Trader account as they'll see. Uh, never mind the Sith mine, Sith mining account, which is just kicking ass. So without further ado, uh, I, let me just take take a quick look here at the. At the chat, okay, yeah, no, just making sure everyone can hear me. I think it's good. Yes, Vladimir, um, the time change did screw everything up, didn't it? it? You know, the same thing happened last year. It was really bloody annoying, but, uh, hey, it's always 3 p.m. Central European time, and then it gets goofy when GMT changes, and uh, our apologies. Uh, so let me just go through the slides here, and we'll queue up what's on deck today. Uh, current market analysis, we're going to talk about what's going on, what we're doing, a little bit of live trading, not too much trading. We actually did a bunch of trading this morning. And now uh, with the U.S. market, with a time change, the U.S. market opens up uh, at uh, 4.30 our time, right? Or, no, 3.30, 4.30, 4.30. Now I'm all confused with the damn time change. It doesn't matter, but it won't be during our show. So we're kind of waiting for that to see what happens. Market staying strong. And the topic today is the Bitcoin halving, why it's different this time from, from different halvings, what we were kind of expecting leading up to, to now today, and what we're doing going forward and how I'm positioning accounts for what I expect to happen. Again, I'm never in the business of making predictions. Sometimes I'll have hunches. I'll have thoughts and I'm leaning one way or another for a reason, but I never you know, bet the farm on that. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then at the end, as always, we're going to have a little Q and A sec, uh, section. Uh, I'm just going to quickly look at some numbers here. And this is from the synthetic miner account. I'll go through these, but a little bit later on, Richard's actually going to go in detail uh, over over some of the, uh, over, over the account itself. But here's uh, the, the update for the synthetic miner account. Now, let's not forget, this account was started uh, six weeks ago. We had about $5,200 at that time, USD, whatever that bought us in Bitcoin. It was uh, 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 0.0825 Bitcoin, I think. 0.0825, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's right there on the screen. Yeah, so you didn't have to remember. So we're up. Uh, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Equity up on, on both those numbers. Uh, and the amount of Bitcoin we've mined is up over 11%, which is quite nice. So that's just kind of, we just generated 11% more Bitcoin with 5,000 bucks than we had to begin with. So that's pretty cool. You can see the cash values up um, about $6,600. And our annualized return, 626%. Uh, USD HODL annualized return is 111%. And, you know, I, I don't know if we need to keep this in here, the cost of mining half an hour, man hours per week. It's not. We don't spend that long on this account, but uh, we had to put something in there. Uh, actually, what I'll do, Richard, is... Uh, just go to the next slide because you made some uh, you, you made some graphs here. If you, maybe you could take us through these two graphs. Yeah, so forgive the few data points I've got. So the, the line's a bit jagged. Uh, I've not been particularly meticulous about recording uh, every day. But this is the, the sort of profile so far. So you can see there's a little bit of volatility in returns. This graph is the returns in terms of Bitcoin on our Bitcoin. And so here we are at the end of the graph at 11 point something percent return after 42 days. Um, and we've, you see we went up to uh, what 7% in the first mm. two weeks and then down to almost zero and then up to six and then up again. And this is kind of in line with the market moving up and down. Basically when the market goes up, we realize a profit or if it stays the same. And if the market goes down, then we take, take a small temporary loss and, um, and then capitalize later. Yeah, and just so people, this is this is the amount of Bitcoin. This is the amount of Bitcoin, and the red line the, along the bottom there is the amount of extra Bitcoin you'd make if you just hodled, yeah. uh, which of course is zero because you're just holding zero. Bitcoin. Uh, so we actually increased yeah. our, our Bitcoin stash. Um, and then if I click next, I go to the same graph. This is in USD terms. 
So the orange line is how many your, your return in USD if you had just hodled over the period. So you'd have made something like 14%, is it? And return in USD by doing the mining by the mining activity increases that return to 26-ish percent. So it almost, almost doubles the return in dollars. So we're pretty happy with that. Very happy with that. Now, you know, of course, the the, the danger with the, this type of strategy is what if Bitcoin just goes down, 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 down? Well, you're in the same boat if you're hodling anyways, uh, but at least we'll be accumulating more Bitcoin so that when it does go back up, we'll have and, more. Yeah, and also if we felt that we were in a downtrend, a secular downtrend, we, we, we would change the 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 contracts we were, tra- we were trading. Yeah, cool. Fantastic. Uh, here, let me... Uh, let me uh, uh, turn these slides off. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Let's jump over the charts. We'll take a look at uh, what's happened and uh, some of the trading we've, we've done this week. So bear with me for a quick second here. This should bring up. You can see my screens here. Excellent. So we've got uh, Ethereum. Again, it's just kind of mirroring uh, Bitcoin right now. Uh, some people are seeing a little bit of enhanced performance uh, f- from their ETH, but uh, we're sticking to Bitcoin. So this was interesting. We had this massive run up, went up to what seventy three and a half thousand or so, seventy seventy two seven, whatever it was. Uh, seventy three is way back here. Seventy three and a half, right? Yep, that's right. Seventy three point seven, something like that. Now we had this little run up uh, recently. We went up to to, to over seventy two, seventy two and a half. And then a, a pullback. And then yesterday, before the CPI print, we were a little bit concerned about that print coming out one way or the other. It's a hot topic right now. You know, it's a hot topic, inflation. There is a lot of speculation because it's a, a you know, a, a, an election year. They weren't going to let those numbers look bad, but they look pretty bad. So before that came out, we covered a lot of puts, especially the synthetic miner account, which was a nice thing to do. Uh, even though we didn't need to do it, but but it looked like it at first. We bought extra puts and bought some extra calls just from some wing protection. It, nothing stranger, you know, before any economic event that often happens. Vols weren't incredibly high. They were certainly higher than they are now. But there was a, a little bit of, uh, I think, nervousness in the market. And I said, well, you know what? I think if this number comes in hot, if if things are looking a little bad, I think we're just going to get a knee jerk down. And if we get a knee jerk down and it goes right back up, oh boy, I think we're going to see new highs in Bitcoin soon. Maybe not before the official halving ends. I don't know. But by the end of April into early May, I I think we're going to be at new highs. I, I really did. And what happened? Well, we had this move down right back up. It was short-lived, but it was beautiful trading. And the reason why it was beautiful for me is I felt that no matter what, the print number was we had this massive support here mid 60s and if i scroll out a little further we had this huge support down here when we scared the pants off everybody just a few weeks ago down in the low 60s i'm like there's no way i don't think this thing is blasting through the mid 60s so what do we do we took the opportunity and when this thing went down sold a shit ton or maybe a family show i shouldn't swear sold a ton of uh, put spreads down here. As soon as it bounced up, (laughs) sold a ton of call spreads up here. Overnight, zero DTE. Some things expiring tomorrow and a little bit expiring on Saturday. Almost everything's been bought back. It's been quite, quite beautiful. So I think we were really happy with this trading, a little bit of scalping in there. Now on the Rogue account, these are more of the discretionary accounts. The Rogue account, we just did a little bit of this, you know, maybe a fifth of it just to earn some extra premium. And it was lovely because, as you know, in crypto, that premium collapses super fast in those, in those you know, one, two, three days. So it's always nice to just pull in, pull in, pull in all that premium. And the other reason why I leaned on this and I loved it so much, and if you follow our live streams, you can go to Patreon uh, forward slash Rogue Trader Academy. You can see us doing this every day. The reason why I love this so much is I had all this extra coverage. I had extra coverage on the upside and the downside. So even when I was selling these spreads, I saw double, triple, maybe on some expires, quadruple, because I sold multiple strikes and I tend to scale into things. So it was a very profitable couple of days for us. So that was quite a beautiful thing. 
Now, let's talk a little bit about the um, the trade strategy, and basically the the topic is why the having is different this time. A lot of articles about, out there, people talking different things, especially up until last week. Now we're so close to the having. I don't think much is going to happen at all. Probably most people. I think the market is already discounting that if we look at the skew. Uh, actually, I think we're towards looking at that just before the call. But every having we saw a decline in price. But we never had a situation like this. We never had a situation with ETF inflows. And what happened earlier this week? Well, guess what? Hong Kong says... They're going to rush through. And I think Richard posted an article the other day to our group saying that they're going to try and push through literally within weeks, maybe even next week, which which is crazy. You know, this regulatory, I don't know how they're going to do that on, on the regulatory side. That combined with the ETF inflows in the United States, I don't know. I don't know. Bets are off the table. I think if anything, we're, we're, we're going up. I don't know who's selling. I think the uh, grayscale uh, ETF outflows are less and less and less. They're not much. I think Richard has those stats. I don't know. I, I like this thing going up. So our position hasn't really changed. We felt leading up to the having, we could have some weakness. I didn't feel that the low 60s was going to break. If it did, it'd probably just be a wick through. Who knows? Anything can happen. It's crypto. It's Bitcoin. But I was happy to basically use that range, the low 70s to low 60s, sell it. I wouldn't be selling iron condors. I'd be selling the spread separately so it might end up being an iron condor. But I was happy to sell spreads using those resistance and support areas. But overall, I want my delta to remain positive. That's not to say I won't have negative deltas at certain times of the day or for a day or two as I'm, uh, you know, unloading short calls or whatever the heck I'm doing. But if we take off, you bet that I'm going to be selling puts like there's no tomorrow. You could bet that I've got a lot of trigger orders in there for futures because this thing takes off. I don't want to. It sucks when you're in a trending market and you're losing money because you're trading against the trend. We don't want that. So that's how I'm positioning from a, from a macro uh, viewpoint this having. I don't think it's going to follow the pattern of the previous having. So we kind of see that already p- playing out. So there's nothing too, too new there, but I think we're nothing but up. And it, the fact that we've been holding this price area, literally just a couple of thousand dollars off all time high on a $70,000 asset. I don't know. It seems to me we're probably going to go up. Now that I say that the gods of trading are probably going to smite me. It will be at 40 tomorrow. And I apologize for that, but, that's that's the way I'm looking at this, and that's how we're trading it. We're, I'm happy to sell calls opportunistically, and you bet they're going to be covered a minimum of one-to-one, probably two-to-one, just because I want to be able to escape out of those, let the cover make me money. I'm going to flip them over to puts or strangles or whatever the heck I need to do, depending on where the skew's at at that time. So that's the end of my soapbox about about the um, – here, let me let me go back over here and stop screen sharing about what we're going to do for the having. I don't know, Richard. I think you're basically in the same boat as me with this. Yeah, I I don't like being short delta at the, the moment, um, so I, I tend to be biased a little bit long. Um, I uh, although my my feeling about the expiry, sorry about the the halving, is that it's probably the single most telegraphed expiry uh, uh, halving ever. Um, and I also feel that the supply issue of Bitcoin going forward is n- not really as big as what's going to happen with the flows in ETFs. Um, I'm in two minds at the moment as to whether the flows into ETFs have been strag- retail stragglers only or people who otherwise felt they, they should be in Bitcoin but didn't know how to or didn't trust exchanges and so on. Um, and there's, there is a school of thought that says you know that's kind of it. You, you, you've hoovered, hoovered up the, the 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 people who are left, rich people who are already already have family offices and financial advisors were probably already long crypto anyway in some way or form, and institutions um, not. The, the the big question now is will institutions start allocating themselves into crypto, and I, and I just don't know because you, you know you you speak to different people on the street and you get you get a very different view. Um, I suspect the vast majority of Wall Street 
types would think of Bitcoin as a toxic thing to make quick money out of trading. Um, I, I think that that we are we are in, in the cryptocurrency world, and we we kind of tend to discuss the narrative of Bitcoin being a store of value, digital gold, etc. And that sounds very convincing for us in this world, but it's completely unconvincing for very skeptical, hard-nosed traders out there on the street who measure their P&Ls in dollars. So I, I don't know. And so I think my, my strategy here is to just let risk roll off and go sit on the beach. <laughs> the infamous beach strategy. <clears throat> Indeed. Excellent. Yeah. I, I don't think we want to get go down that rabbit hole today about kind of you know, the digital gold thing. Um, but, you know, there's no face in the facts. We probably mentioned this before that there's no reason to own Bitcoin. It, well, despite the fact that it doesn't throw off a dividend or pay any kind of a yield, um, is it a store against, against – we, we know the fiat is going to constantly decline. It always does. It always will in, until it eventually goes to zero and collapses, whether that's in five years or 500 years, who knows. But, um, yeah, as soon as the herd gets wind that it's going down, it, it'll go down fast. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that's going to happen. I think we've got a lot of upside to go. I wouldn't be surprised to see 100K, 200K. I, I would not be surprised, and I'm kind of betting that that's going to happen. But – at some point in its future, there's going to be some massive drawdowns. Now, the interesting thing I mentioned about the Hong Kong uh, pushing through ETFs, you got to think about. Uh, now, I don't know, I don't know enough about this to understand how mainland Chinese people can utilize uh, a Hong Kong structure. So, if if there's, I know some people can, maybe some people can't. I don't know enough about this, and I actually like to get a bit of education on this, but. We all know that the Chinese are stuck. They cannot invest in very many things. They can't short the markets. They're very limited as to what they can and can't buy. If this opens up to the Chinese, oh my gosh, it'll be it'll be like a flood of money, in my opinion, or, or a flood of, of volatility. Um, because uh, and, and again, it depends on what you see Bitcoin as. Um, you might see it as a as a medium on which to gamble. In which case, you're going to inject volatility into the market through that behavior. You might see it as a store of value, in, in which case you're going to inject upward upward um, calmness into the market. You, you may, might see it as just toxic and you might be shorting it. Uh, so I, you know, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion, but I think I think it's probably more likely than not that we go up from here. But I, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see a year in which we see a million dollar Bitcoin followed by fifty thousand dollar bitcoin <laughs> in the same year you know <laughs> can, can you imagine trying to time that short <laughs> yeah terrifying indeed yeah uh, that's why we why we have op options <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you know if you just went long in the underlying and you just sold uh perps can yeah. you imagine what what the funding rate would be what you'd be earning uh, it might be insane uh, two weeks ago on OKX, you were earning 60% a year by selling perps against Bitcoin. I mean, you, you do better just by selling perps than you would just by owning the underlying. Um, yeah. Uh, I, my, my personal strategy is, to, is for the Bitcoin I hold is to, is to, you know, the point where it pays off my mortgage to do that. Because at least then I don't have to, have to worry about being clever any, anymore. So. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so sometimes being too clever uh, backfires. Yeah. Trust me, There's, been there, done, the, been there, done that. The, the world is full of opportunity. The, the options market teaches us, right, that the world is full of opportunity every day. Today's opportunity is Bitcoin, maybe whatever altcoin you're, you're into. But that, you know, that doesn't mean that there's going to be no opportunities tomorrow. So missing missing one boat doesn't mean you missed all the boats. Um, yeah, 100%. And it's really important to take your wins down again where you can get them, yeah. particularly if they ratchet up your last time. Hey, would, Richard, would you mind sharing your screen and just uh, let's just jump over the Rogue Trader account. We'll take a quick look. Uh, actually, I don't know if we really need to do much in the Rogue Trader account. Maybe let's just take a look at the Synth Miner account yeah. uh, and the altcoins. Uh, yeah. yeah. Just, and for people just... who want to follow us on the Rogue Trader account, of course, you could you can join us at Rogue Trader Academy or, of course, the, the Patreon live streams, Rogue Trader Academy uh, at Patreon. So we've been... I just I was just looking at the vol. Actually, we've been interesting to see vol has just been dropping off, even though the market's been actually stronger. Uh, that's unusual. We normally see a correlation between rising vols and rising spot. Um, so I 
don't quite know what's going on there. I guess I guess anticipation of a, a US sell-off maybe. Uh, we'll see if that comes. Um, then on the I think I was looking at the Dvol and we are we have the lowest um, average vol we've seen for the past month. I'd like to think <clears throat> that we're trending down because I'm short vol and I've been waiting for this moment for you know the past month. Um, being it's been been made to wait. Um, but I wouldn't be at all surprised to see it bounce back up to 75 on any kind of spook or scare. Um, but I also wouldn't be surprised to see it down to 60 if nothing happens in the next, next few days. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's a game of two halves at the moment. Um, then going to the synth minor account where we, you saw the stats for it. Um, here we are, uh, our 12th of, our 12th of April's rolled off. We, we we took them off earlier, didn't we? We paid sort of fourteen bips and eleven bips to get these these positions off. Um, yeah, we paid we, just before the CPI came out. We thought, right. ah, you know what? Let's just clear them off. Where you know eighty ninety percent of the value was blue. I don't know. So. Yeah, there we go. So it just asked me to refresh. Um, <clears throat> and then as the market dipped, we sold um, another put spread here on the nineteenth of April. We, um, we sold two. So we brought back one this morning. That's right. We sold two because um, yeah. we had we had one residual that, that was that already yeah. there, and it was right next to the, the cover of the one we sold. So we we decided to take off that. We had two strikes, one short, one long, within a thousand dollars of each other. So the net premium to be made from that position was pretty low. We feel pretty safe about the low sixties as, as a as a kind of base. So we we were happy to widen out this cover, and just see if we could pull out what's this uh, seventy basis points over the next seven days. So this is sort of ten basis points a day. And then we thought we'd sell a couple of put spreads in April. Um, not trying to get the full 70, 10 basis points a day per, per contract, but just getting something in embedded in there just to start pulling in some premium, um, just in case the market raced up. And we felt that if the market did drop off, then we've got plenty of time before it gets through 62. So and we can do something about this. Um, and the other thing that, I, that we so so here's the, the current um, uh, net asset value. Ignore the dollars side of it, but the um, the Bitcoin 0 0.0917. We started with 0 0.0825. Current equity value 6,475. We started with 5,200 dollars, I think, or that, that, that. so we made yeah. about a thousand bucks. Yeah. Um, actually, well, we made made 20% return in dollars and. Um, what was it 14 percent in bitcoin 11 percent 11 percent yeah you're right yeah, yeah. i think we're, we're perfectly happy with that and then in terms of the cash on the account uh there's 0 0.0940 it's almost 0 0.1 of a bitcoin uh, on that account now the next time we write a contract that, that'll be up to 0 0.1 um so that that'll be you know that'll be a 25 percent increase in cash and all we have to do is let it realize um and then the other thing was that was worth looking at was the PL analysis. What was that PL analysis? Because um, one thing that always bugs people is the fees, um, and uh, <clears throat> I don't. Um, oh yeah, that's what this, so that, there's our, our PL. Here's our fees. Um, so in the past forty days, we've spent point zero zero two five of a Bitcoin in fees, which is about what. Um, Four percent of an AV, I think. Uh, oh no! If, if, if you're asking me to calculate it in that, my head, it's not going to happen. It's about no, it's about twenty percent of of, uh, of what we've made. So we, we've actually about twenty percent of what we've made. We've given up as fees to Deribit. Now, um, yeah, because we made just over point one of a Bitcoin. Yeah, point zero, point zero one. Yeah. 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 And we've paid 0 0.0025 in fees. Sure. Now, it's, it doesn't pay to get too upset about this. I mean, we're dealing in small sizes and we're a small account. So we're on the highest fee tier. Fee tier. Um, if you trade in bigger size, you do get discounts. Um, uh, but nevertheless, there are ways we can mitigate fees. So we've been trading with single single legs. We've been legging in to the short, the long strike. Mm -hmm. What you can do is go in um, and do a, a combo strategy. Um, and you, you can pick your strikes and then build build a combo here and then execute here. You don't always get the best price. You can sometimes get a better price um, by doing the outrights. And that's I think I think there's more liquidity coming to Derbit tell us that that this is going to improve. But if you can get the same price on this screen as you can 
by changing the outrights. You should do it here because you pay only half fees on one of the legs on this screen. So you'll, you'll always get a better deal if, if you're trading at the same price. So ten, you should tend to, if you're going to trade spreads, you should tend to prefer to spread trade spreads here. Do we do you want to enter an order so people can see how to use the strategy? The yeah. Week? So um, what, what do you want to trade? Which week? The nineteenth, twenty sixth, or the third of May? Uh, let's do the third of May because we got nothing there. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's look at the we'll just... bowl, 60, 65 bowl down there. We're, we're, we're playing with fire by selling sixty five bowl, but um, that's okay. Yeah. Third of May. All right. So let's look at a spread here. Um, uh, well, if the cup was at fifty six and we sold the 62, we'd be picking up 100 basis points. Actually, if we sold the 64, picking picking up 170 basis points for 21 days, that's almost 10 basis points a day. Mm -hmm. okay. Quite aggressive, right? But I, I'd be okay with the 62s uh, in this case, because we've, we've uh, uh, we're already at our goal with the other um, okay. positions right. we have on. We're only using 13% margin. Yeah, so. that's, on, that's on the 18 delta that's kind of right at the edge of the one deviation move i think mm -hmm. that's okay right so if we if we sell the 62k puts and, and buy the 56k puts so we're just going to go to strategy 62 56 i'll have to remember this be really nice i'll remember if, if you could pick it off the screen so i'm going to create a combo btc uh i'm going to choose a put spread uh, expiry is going to be the third, third of May. yep yeah and then the 56, 62. 56, and then 60. I oh know it's got to be, you've got to do this one first. 62, 56. So it's quoting us that the mark price of this is 110. Uh, and we can trade it at either 100 or 115. So we'd have to, we're going to pay sort of five pips to trade it. Uh, we'd, we'd probably end up doing that if we cross the spreads anyway on the, on the outright market. Maybe even, maybe even worse. I'm not going to worry too much about it, but I'm, I'm going to create the RFQ and then go and find it in the RFQs. There it is. And then I'm going to go and put in a sell order to sell one at 109. Sell. And that isn't, isn't taking obviously we're, we're in the order book, but we can, we can, maybe we do the same, we keep same thing we do with on the outright markets. We can just modify the order. Just for the sake of argument. There you go, filled at 108. Oh, no, it's just it's just order, order edited, not filled. Oh, sorry, sorry. I saw, I saw the red yeah. thing come up. I yeah. yeah. <laughs> Six. It'll probably go at five, right? Oh, they've moved it. What? That's they've, because they've someone's moved. watching and they're probably pulling up their bids. All right, then I'm, then I'm not playing. I'm, I'm going back out to 106. 107. Yeah. Screw you. Yeah. <laughs> Screw you guys! I'm going home. Yeah, so we'll just we'll just leave that order in and wait for it to get filled. Yeah, and I see Paul was asking a question here, uh, asking to demonstrate a combo for selling a spread. So, so there you go. Yeah. And as soon as that fills, you'll just see it show up, just like you would any other uh, order. Yeah, yeah, and you've got you've got. It, you've got it, I mean, you, there's probably only one or two market makers here. If you look at this this uh, price, there's only two two levels here, right? Three levels, including us. So, tells me that there's maybe two or three market makers there. Not not many. And they've probably got software that's watching us walk down towards them that will just gradually walk away from us. Hang on, Richard. Um, Richard, I, I, I wasn't. Vladimir says we created the wrong spirit. He said selling the higher strike and buying the lower. Were you were you selling the lower and buying the higher? Uh, you have to click on it because and, you, and you'll get a confirmation uh, like an order box, which which. Yeah, but yeah. But I, so it's confusing, right? So this 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 spread is to add one of the 62 put and to subtract one of the 56 put but I've, I've sold but i've sold the combo so you reverse the signs so i'm this is actually because i'm selling it it's actually minus one 62k put and plus one 56k put so if you click on the order box again i think you'll see that more clearly like if you click on yeah yeah here so if you click on the cell it says here sell the 62 by the it spells it out for you yeah yeah, and and that that's that's a good point, Lord. But you wouldn't believe the amount of times I've been there. But they're like, hang on, hang on, are we doing the right thing? And, yeah. and that order box will show you there on the bottom uh, what you're doing if you're hitting the buy or the sell. So yeah. thank you for bringing that up because it's it's, it's yeah. worth knowing. Uh, I, I'm gonna I'm actually just gonna sit on the on the on the uh, on the mid price here because I I don't like being monkeyed with with them moving away from my price. 
that's that bonus. Okay, so we got so we got so we don't normally do the real time questions here because we're doing some real time trading. Uh, so yeah. Paul says uh, the previous screen with the green plus one confused me is for the wrong leg. Okay, exactly the red minus one. I can't flip it around. Yes, you just create the combo and then you're either going to buy it or sell it, and each side is going to tell you what's happening. Again, when you when you find the combo you want and the existing combos, and you click the order box, and you put your price in there, you're going to see what's happening right underneath the sell box. It'll tell you what it, what it will execute. Underneath the buy box, it'll tell you what it'll execute. Yeah, it's, it's always worth reading the small print. Um, that's that's a really good move by, by Darabit to, to put this in, because it's really important to be to get it right. Because nothing more painful than unwinding a trade and doing it again and paying yeah. six times the spread. And, and <laughs> Six tons of fees. <laughs> yeah, but don't feel too bad if you do it because we've all been there and done it. We've all done it. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I, I did it. I did it once in huge size. I actually fat fingered a trade the wrong direction. Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was going to make a joke that we don't have time. Uh, so, hey, one last thing. Would you mind just bring? So everybody knows we put on a Matic, an XRP, and a Solana trade. We threw out some iron condors because we didn't know what the heck to do with them. Not a lot of liquidity. We don't really know the assets. Well, the Matic trade was was uh, expired on the uh, la excuse me last week. Hmm. It actually expired just slightly in the money, almost at the money. And guess what? We actually lost money on that trade, despite the credit we received overall, because the spreads are so wide. It was a little challenging. Now, both the Solana and the XRP, we bought back the short legs quite some time ago, I think. And we just had the shrapnel at the long legs, but there was no market for it. So what are we going to do with these altcoins? Well, we don't follow, we're, we're not, you know, crypto crazy enthusiast degens. We're, we're just regular degens. So we sort of decided that from time to time, as we see different news coming out or uh, different events happen, we're going to maybe counter trade them or we're going to trade for a directional positional trade. We're not going to sell in those altcoins because it's just not worth it with the spreads and the liquidity right now. Now, I know this is something that Deribit's working on. Hey, you can't just introduce a new product on these you know, lately traded things and expect the world to show up. It's going to take some time before we can trade them like we do with ETH and Bitcoin options. But I thought I'd just mention there, that. Yeah. There, there is a trade. There's a trade I'm thinking of doing with with Matic, um, and that's because you know, you know, just recently we've had the news that the SEC have written a Wells letter to uh, the guys at uh, Uniswap, and as a result, the Uniswap token dropped. I don't know, ten, twenty percent, um, and uh, it's it's fairly common knowledge that the SEC are investigating every um, DeFi protocol in a massive overreach of of uh, power, but. You know, they're going to try anyway. Why not? Why not? Um, uh, and it's not entirely impossible that um, Polygon guys receive a, a Wells letter as well, right, in the in the near future. And if they do, um, and the market is not sufficiently numb uh, uh, because of an overinflux of Wells letters, then you might you might arguably see Matic sell off by 10, 20 percent. And so maybe there's a trade to do where i don't know currently it's trading at around 0.9 but you could put a put spread in at 0.7 maybe now be really careful because the mark on the 0.6 is seven bips but look at the ask here someone's someone's um, you know really trying for it the, the, the empty order book and they mass put put in a massive ask if you were just <laughs> if you were to sweep that you'd, you'd regret it very quickly <laughs> um but it may maybe you know i don't know what, what do you think like buy a, you could buy the 0. 0.8 and sell yeah. the 0. 0.7 maybe you know to, eh. yeah and normally when we do directional bets we're setting up a butterfly or we'll do like a, a one by two so we're buying one put and selling two to pay for it or something mm. but there's not enough market there the, the those those further out of the money uh, strikes there's just no market and the interesting thing and i'm not sure so the the the, the latest the, the farthest strike is the end of april here there's no maze out and i'm not sure yeah. why i'm not sure when uh Darabit puts those maze out and I mean, another another thing you could do if you didn't think matic was going to get drip 
driven up in the whole post halving euphoria. Let's assume it's going to happen. You could actually just sell like an in the money uh, call. Um, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, a put? You could buy, buy an in the money put or something, or, or, or you know, something like this. Because, um, uh, you know, get get some premium. Actually, no, sell, sell in the money call, right? So get some premium and, and also pick up value if the market drops. I'm not touching that one. Yeah, I know. I mean, you, you enjoy that one. Uh, I I'd rather counter trade. Hey, if 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 something news comes out, Matic wants to drop twenty thirty percent. Hey, you know what? I'll buy some calls and, and bet on a bounce, uh, or maybe at that point I'll sell yeah. a put spread or something. Like yeah. I think we need to be reactionary unless we have uh, you know some info. But if if it drops like twenty twenty cents, then yeah, you're right because the vol would go up to like one hundred and forty, and you could yeah. pile in there. Yeah. And it's in, in the run out of strikes, they'll have to have a new expiry. So, I, I, I did that actually last, uh, about a month ago, or maybe six weeks ago, with the news on you know, New York Community Bank when they, right. they had that uh, massive concern over um, nonsense in their books and lots of uh, New York office blocks that were underwater. I actually sold um, $4 puts on that stock. Um, and even though it ended up below $4, I made, I made money because I sold at 200 volt. Um, that was a, that was a nice trade. 200 vol, insane, insane. <laughs> uh, you know that doesn't last long, right? Especially <laughs> no, right. especially on you know. Well, that, that's the thing, right? No, no market can sustain can yeah. sustain 200 vol yeah. for more than like three days, right? Because yeah. all the all the longs run out of money. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, we, we've uh, we've gone grossly over time again. I apologize. Uh, we've got a few questions, Richard. Let me just blast these off, okay? Yeah. Uh, Jeremy says, is there a video that explains how you built the synthetic mining account? Well, well pre previous videos, you can watch them on, on our YouTube channel. Uh, pre pre previous yeah. of these, they're a bit live channel. We, they, they're they oh. published on our YouTube channel, Rogue Trader Academy, and they're also published on, on the Der Deribit channel. Uh, uh, YouTube, YouTube channel. Yeah. We'd obviously much rather you came to ours because then we get more views <laughs> and eventually we might even get some monetization. Yeah. Um, yeah and I think actually there, there, it's on Deribit Insights too. If you go to Deribit right. Insights page. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. Cause I, sometimes I think they have trouble with the YouTube channel because of the, the topic, but uh, so basically it's not like a bot we built. It's just a style of trading we're, we're, we're employing. So a uh, question from Sergey. Uh, question to Richard. Develop my own auto hedger and testing various values for common settings like target delta, delta threshold, minimum delta to hedge, thinking to make delta threshold a dynamic value based on market dynamics. Can you share your thoughts on auto hedger, hedger configuration? Otherwise, I'm going to subscribe for gold level course and ask personally. Okay, don't answer because <laughs> then he's going to subscribe. There are a bunch of things. Uh, uh, yeah, it would be it'd be great to speak to you. So, um, and we, we of course, oh, we got got, got filled on our uh, our spread. Um, uh, looking forward to speaking to you. Um, please do sign up. We've got families to feed. Uh, and uh, um, yes, dy dy dynamically changing the delta threshold is is useful. Um, we there's a number of signals we take from the vol surface uh, and moving averages to give us a feel for future direction um, at the moment. So just, just to give you an example, um, uh, I'm going to let you into some of my inner secrets here. Um, the fact that vols are dropping while uh, market's going up tells me that the chances are the market doesn't believe the rally and that in fact we've got risk, risk reversals going negative at 10 delta. Uh, gives me the, a feeling, a fair amount of comfort that we'll see weakness before we see strength. Um, at least that's what the, the that's what the market's telling us at the moment. That we tend to find that these vol movements involves quite predictive of where Bitcoin's going to go. Um, so you might that's something you might want to consider. Um, this is a tool we use from a firm called Immersive Finance, run by a very good friend of mine, uh, Will McGee. Um, and this is you can you can talk to this via API as well. Um, we also use uh, a percentage of net asset value as a, uh, a, a gamma, as a percentage of net asset value as an indicator. So um, a small book obviously needs to hedge on much smaller deltas than a large book um, in notional terms. And so gamma is the risk factor here. So we, we, we tend to have our sort of emergency hedging based on, based on a, um, a breach of delta by a percentage of gamma. 
Okay. Um, hopefully that answered uh, at least some of the question, but uh, look forward to talking, talking to Sergey. And I, and I love that. Richard's like, we got families to feed. <laughs> love it. Love it. We'll be panhandling on the corner later too. Uh, so, so we answered the questions from Paul about the, the combo and you can see the t- combo got filled while, while Richard was, was showing the immersive yeah, finance screen. That's cool. Uh, Dominic asked, how do you track your calendar trades? And by a bit, there's no way to somehow tag two option trades as one setup. Uh, um, that's a good question. Because because I don't. Be- because because it all ends up just blending into the book of options. Uh, unless uh, I have a small I, account where I set up. Yeah, I, 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 the thing is, it's, it's, a, it's a false truth to, to try and track these combos as, as, as a single trade. Once the once the trade's done, you, all you've got is a book, you, and you've got a book full of trades, and you've got to manage that book, and it won't matter um, that that you you know you want to take profit on fifty percent of your spread and and so on. It, it, it's 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 a very very common way to think at the beginning, um, but it doesn't it really doesn't matter. Um, I know that on my interactive brokers account, if I do a combo trade on stock options. Um, it will actually track that that combo trade for me, and I can break it down and so on. But it isn't really necessary. It's just a, a bookkeeping thing. Um, and in Bitcoin, honestly, if you're trading short call spreads and put spreads, when you buy back your short leg, you probably want to leave your cover in anyway, because you know Bitcoin well, can move. You know, yeah, and we do. You'll, yeah. you'll be you'll be glad you did. Uh, you know. Yeah, we have some uh, specific strategies around that that we employ. And of course, if you, if you want to chat with us, you can always join us on our live stream over at Patreon. Uh, market's a little bit weak; just came down a thousand bucks. Interesting. Okay, we're almost done here. I can hear uh, this, this trades here, going off. What? Vladimir uh, said, uh, "Guys, please tell me at which point of time, on uh, which period, and what size should I buy wing protection to be able to sell any type of options in future with attention to always to have protect?" Oh, yeah, big question. Um, that's a, that's a subject for a longer discussion. Okay, because uh, it depends on the strategy. Uh, one last uh, comment here from uh, Dominic. Thanks for your feedback last time regarding always buying the on- iron condor covers first, or at least always stay fully hedged. Works great so far. Awesome. So now I'm using this like a grid trading approach where I sell when IV rises, the market goes in one direction and vice versa. I love it, man. Love it. I love building spreads one piece at a time because you get them so much cheaper. It doesn't always work out, but, um, you know, it, it, it's just, you know, just selling an iron condor smack in the middle, you know, you, you're going to, you're going to feel the heat on one side. Now, if the market goes perfectly flat and you know, it's going to go perfectly flat, then great. Uh, that's a great trade. But, uh, I love building out spreads. So glad to hear that's working out for you. Uh, Richard, I think that's all time we got. We went a little bit over time again. We tend to do that, but uh, great questions, everyone. Any, any last comments, Richard, before we take off? Uh, no, I think so. Uh, you know, thanks, everyone, for, for, for coming on board, and uh, we really appreciate the, the questions. Um, yep. Yeah, I, uh, as you say, a bit of, bit of weakness we're seeing. Well, we saw a bit of you know spike up, spike down. I think there's just a bit of shenanigans in a, a very unliquid market. No one knows, really knows what to do. I think all the gamma points to being in this range up until the end of the month, if all, mm. the, all the outstanding open interest, mm. unless there's a really strong news flow to drive spot through the the, the strikes. Um, mm-hmm. I wouldn't at all be surprised to see us trading in a $2,000 range for the next week. Well, let me tell you, every time we dip down, I'm buying calls. We go up, I'm buying puts because yeah. I don't trust this market. I think something's going to bust, and I wouldn't be surprised to see some of that Hong Kong news come out and so maybe next week we'll be we'll be looking at a completely different market. I guess we'll see. Okay. All right, everyone. That's it for today. Thanks so much. And we'll see you next Thursday. Thanks for joining us, everyone.